Howdy folks, uh, today we're talking about the art of the future. No, not soulless, borderline, copyright infringing AI art, uh, but the art of future cityscapes and buildings as posted on some of the niche subreddits that care about that kind of thing. Now, I personally love taking in the works of artists who try and engage with the future of architecture and city life because whether these things are what we want to see for our future, elements we are apprehensive about, or are simply something that makes our jaw drop and ask how, well, in this video we're going to muse over that how through just a few cases that I found particularly interesting for one reason or another. The first one I would say is the most accessible, coming to us from Masashi Kageyama as posted on the imaginary tower subreddit titled The Tower. Here we find ourselves peering from the vine-covered streets of an abandoned city, and framed by a sinuous concrete bridge and a row of apartment buildings, we see a pair of towers in the distance connected by a large skybridge of sorts. Now to start, this sort of overgrown cityscape is quite compelling as a visual. We loved it in The Last of Us, and the anime Dr. Stone used it as the Netflix thumbnail despite having like 10 total frames of overgrown architecture in the whole show. If anything, that speaks to the attraction of that sort of imagery, be it an enjoyment of the juxtaposition of concrete and green growth, an underlying desire for a societal reset, or something else. I'll let you commenters decide that because I'm ultimately more interested in the enormous structure. But after thinking about it for a few moments, I realized that what we're looking at is an interesting amalgamation of two Tokyo sky trees with a bridge closely resembling that of the Patronus Towers of Kuala Lumpur. Some close inspection reveals that outer latticework structure of the Tokyo sky tree, as well as the diagonal struts that meet the bridge at mid-span, quite identically to the Malaysian Tower. At first blush, it would seem that this is a very worldly structure, like, a, the, I guess, the opposite of otherworldly. Oh, brother, this guy! Taking an iconic structure, in fact, the third tallest freestanding structure in the world, copy, pasting, and then connecting them, seems simple enough. Well, yes and no. The structural system of the Tokyo Sky Tree is incredibly unique. We discussed it in a bit of depth in the unassuming video about Pokemon's Bellsprout Tower in which we described the structural core like a singular mast that isn't always rigidly connected to that exterior steel latticework and instead uses slide bearings to mitigate the forces and lateral motion induced by something like massive earthquakes. So what about this is funny, well, for one, there are no floors where this sky bridge is assumed to connect. Like after the first five levels, we have to jump about 1,000 feet to reach the next floor. I mean, the structure is primarily a communications tower with a couple of observation decks. Not that the artist has to be entirely faithful to the source of inspiration, but I'm certainly curious to think about how this connecting bridge would impact the structural response in the event of seismic activity. Now it is worth mentioning that sky bridges usually don't actually connect the structures and often have an expansion joint between the two buildings, so that when the buildings were to sway in dissonance under lateral loading, that bridge isn't responsible for physically tying the two together. Expansion joints often completely isolate each structure, though for a bridge like this there may be some element that tries to uh, vertically tie them together to allow for smooth walking surfaces. And here I'm reminded of this clip of two high-rises during an earthquake that displays the clear design intent in action of one building wholly supporting the bridge while the two swayed multiple feet back and forth. Similarly for our case, it'd be easy to imagine an expansion joint in the middle and the propped struts picking up each half of the bridge. Fair enough, but I mean that's not exactly what I mean uh, when I said the bridge could impact the structural response in an earthquake. It's mostly an acknowledgement that the unique structural system described may have issues with a significant imbalance in the loading. While likely not impossible, again this is a pretty grounded structure, but it may not end up looking quite like the same one we and the citizens of Tokyo see. Now, something I've neglected up to this point is the effect of all that green stuff wrapping the two towers, but that's okay, since the next example, I thought, was a more extreme version of vegetation-covered structures. Annabelle Sikonolfi's g -Sis art, as shared through the Imaginary Towers subreddit, gets at this concept a bit more intentionally. As we see two entirely plant-clad prismatic structures rising from green foothills in a cloudy setting, what kind of structures? I'm not quite sure. Uh, my first instinct was that these two towers were of the residential variety as we've seen similar, somewhat toned down concepts in practice with the Bosco Vertical in Milan, Italy, or the Park Royal in Singapore. 
So you may say that this style of architecture isn't all that futuristic. A dozen renderings like this are made every day by interns trying their best to show how environmentally conscious their designs can be. But the structures seen in Sikonolfi's art have a bit more of a different flavor about them. Rather than terraces or balconies that seat bushes or small trees, they seem to sprout directly from the building's surface. Speaking of which, we can see through the trees at times at what seems to be a glass material, but more often has a red, hot, glowing light emanating from within, and it's consistent of much of the height, certainly adding to my curiosity of the structure. Is this a secret radiator, a Dutch oven? Well, usually on the show, someone would come up with a complicated plan, then explain it with a simple analogy. And while function and occupancy type are critical aspects of the design, I want to go ahead and approach this broadly about the integration of plant life with our structures. Obviously a broad topic in itself, but in the case shared here, it gives me a nice backdrop to rant about designing for that sort of thing. So, what do plants crave? Rondo's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. Well, that and soil. Uh, most plants need soil to get the nutrients to survive, not that I have the green thumb credentials for plant care. And yeah, hydroponics exist, as well as those little succulent things, but point being, plants, roots, soil, and the like would make for a significant addition of weight to the facade of a building like we see here. To put some numbers to it, a typical glass facade would weigh 20 pounds per square foot, whereas planters can have a soil depth of a few inches to multiple feet of soil, not to mention the weights of the plants themselves or the planters that house them. On past projects, I've seen these range from 100 pounds per square foot to over 300 PSF for planters with sizable trees something like 10 times the mass of a standard facade system, on top of the fact that you would still want, at minimum, a standard wall construction somewhere to create a barrier for the elements, Some, unless this is a treehouse. I suppose I hadn't considered that this could just be a massive tree trimmed up like suburban hedges. <laughs> Kids next door would be jealous. Anyways, with all that weight, the structural systems would need to be upsized considerably, well beyond what is typical to account for. I mean, in a video about architectural futurism, the question for this fella is less, can we do it, but more, what are the impacts? Because having some additional or heavier structural members is a trade-off. Not to say that the net amount of greenhouse gases attributable to a green-clad building would be higher than the standard construction, but it's just worth noting that like freedom, greenscape isn't free. Making some rough estimations, the structural weight probably increases by 10 to 20%, meaning increased total project costs of about 5% or several million dollars just in structural costs, but would have a net negative carbon footprint. Now, obviously, that's great as far as environmental impact goes. But at this time, projects like these are still reserved for the novelty, and it's kind of hard to see that changing. Similar to a corporation, we privatize the profits and socialize the losses, the losses here being our air quality and climate for all of the carbon positive buildings out there. Now this little excerpt isn't meant as an exploration into every aspect of greenscaped construction or high rises, but certainly means to highlight some unsung aspects to the idea. Coming up next, we have a work by Zana Bamarni, brought to us by the Imaginary Cityscape subreddit titled Aquapolis. And while sounding like I developed a sudden lisp attempting to pronounce a Greek city, this one brings an eclectic, vertically-oriented cityscape that, as the name suggests, is well integrated with the surrounding body of water. We don't actually see any land in the work of art. And this one is quite fun. Similar to Kagayama's work, I appreciate that the art places us as viewers within the work with a distinct foreground that complements some of the city's primary features. And boy are there a lot of features to take in. If we look first to the background on the left side, we can see some modern skyscraper-shaped silhouettes peeking through the fog. These figures come as a bit of a surprise to me as the architecture we see in the foreground appears as a conglomeration of many different designs, styles, and architects rather than a monolith that we typically associate with modern skyscrapers. And this conglomeration makes for a decent game of I Spy. In a couple of minutes, we'll come back to point out some of these features. I figure I'd give the viewers a chance to find some for yourself. Anyways, coming in from the foggy background, it looks like we'd need to take this standard highway bridge that appears to have some relatively closely spaced pylons, presumably meaning that the water isn't all that deep in the area. But it's this route that brings us to our primary focus, presumably the city of Aquapolis. 
Starting in the center, we have these cantilevering circular terraces supported by a brutalist concrete structure that, as going with the theme of this video, has some relatively sizable trees situated on them, if we take this bus down here at least for scale. And these would seem to be some great features for quality of life if we are to assume that a city named after water has little access to dry land, forests, trees, and the like. These terraces branch off from a core pillar much in the way that a tree itself would expand. And design-wise, this would of course be design and material intensive, as irregularly supported structures often are. But the diagonal struts from below should aid in reducing the stresses developed in these circular elements, as well as the core frames that support them, especially with all that exposed concrete they have. Speaking of which, at first blush, we have some incredibly stout structures in the vicinity. A span to depth ratios for beams will be like span length over 20, but here we have a truss or frame that's about as deep as the span between the columns, a rare case of over-design in future art and architecture, the brutalist design here coming in handy. Now it's kind of hard to tell exactly the extents of everything here, but it looks like there's another core pillar beyond with a terrace that stilts up even higher, creating this view corridor below what appears to be some residential units. And a good example of this comes to mind. A set of three residential towers in Cologne, Germany, called the Crane Houses, employ a very similar form. Alright, so now that we've been marinating on Zana Bamarni's work for a little while now, let's talk about some of the Easter egg references they've left us. First and perhaps most obvious are these washer dryer looking cubes, and these are a pretty direct reference to the Nakagin capsule tower that was built in Tokyo in the 1970s, with each of these blocks intended to be an individual room that could be removed and replaced, kind of like an urban mobile home of sorts. In practice, however, that didn't happen, with most of the connecting points requiring the removal of adjacent units as well, complicating that whole process. And the art here seems to acknowledge that as well, with a fair bit of grime buildup leaving the units in need of good power wash. Another little reference appears in the bottom left here with these white petal-like forms which remind me of the Art Science Museum at Marina Bay Gardens in Singapore, which is situated in reality in a pretty similar manner within meters of the bay. Hard to say much more than that with most of it being obfuscated other than it's a really beautiful building. And lastly, we have these glass tubes running around several faces of the perimeter of the building and even apparently spanning overhead here in the foreground. These look like direct references to the French museum, the Centre Pompidou, which uses an exterior mounted escalator to move people up the five or so levels of the building, and that looks to adopt the same function with the silhouettes of a couple people here on the ride up. But that isn't the only adopted element from the French Museum on display here with these large diameter pipes wrapping the building, doing that Windows 95 screensaver thing, just running up, down, and wherever. And on an entirely uninteresting note, this one here spans like 10 meters or 30 feet between supports. If only I could get the mechanical and plumbing engineers I work with to select this type of piping material since normally I'd have to design several silly little frames to pick up pipes like this certainly not the most fun part of engineering building, so that's my call to action in this video. Let's make structural pipes a thing. Now, to add some concluding remarks to these few examples, because all of a sudden I look down and I've been chatting for like 15 minutes, but it's notable that many of these works are referential to existing architecture, and some of you might find that uninspiring. I get it, uh, if we're thinking of how to design in out-of-the-box ways, it might make sense to start on fresh ground, aiming for skies or horizons, but I can see great value in taking existing designs and recontextualizing or reconceptualizing them. I think it's a dark Darwin quote, something to the effect of nature doesn't jump, and while there are rare instances of architecture jumping, like how the Burj Dubai jumped the previous tallest building with an absurd 62% increase in height, but taking a grounded approach looking at the near future, I think has great value. So thanks for hanging out for this video, musing over some interesting aspects of architectural futurism arts. Uh, these are the posts I found most accessible, but there are a few dozen more in the saved files I'd be happy to sit down and talk about again if y'all liked this one. So please let me know what you think down in the comments or if you have any suggestions. Y'all are awesome. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you later. Adios.